The final item of business today is the Members' Business Debate on Motion Number 15307 in the name of Clare Baker on 10 million missing voters. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would be grateful if those members who would like to speak in this debate could press the request to speak buttons now, please. I call on Clare Baker to open the debate. Seven minutes, please, Ms Baker. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I would also like to thank the members who have signed my motion enabling the debate this evening. We are now less than 100 days away from the Scottish Parliament election and thoughts are now focusing on how do we secure those votes. But as today's motion highlights, we are facing a significant challenge in electoral registration. Electoral registration undermines our democratic system. The accuracy, the comprehensiveness and the integrity of the register is vital to a healthy democracy. That is why the reports from the Smith Institute, 10 million missing voters, and Hope Not Hate's report into individual electoral registration and the boundary review are so concerning. It is feared that hundreds of thousands of voters in Scotland will be lost from the electoral register as a result of the rush to change to a new electoral registration system. Originally due to be finalised in December 2016, the UK Government shortened the transition period to December 2015. During the transition period, voters on the existing register had to be verified. Those who couldn't be verified within the shortened timescales were then removed from the register. Scotland is one of the most affected areas in the UK by this, and this level of unregistered citizens risks undermining our democracy as we lead up to the elections this year and to next year's local authority elections and the EU referendum. This will also have a profound impact on the upcoming review of the Boundary Commission into Westminster constituency seats across the UK, leading potentially to distorted electoral maps and underrepresentation of minorities, students, renters and young people. This is something that should concern us all and something we should all work together to address as a parliament. We have a responsibility to not ignore this situation. The Smith Institute's report headline figure refers to 10 million voters and does include those who decide not to register to vote, some 7.5 million people across the UK. What the rush changes to the electoral system will do, changes that were pushed through a year early by the Conservative Government against the advice from the Electoral Commission, is increase that figure by 2.5 million voters. 2.5 million people who are expected to fall off the electoral register. As the Smith Institute report states, what is at stake here is not just the prospect of party political advantage, but the integrity and value of the democratic process. This is not about the merits of household registration or individual registration, but the household registration system was introduced through the 1918 Representation of the People Act and has changed very little in the intervening century. So this is a significant change and it's one that needed to be properly managed. The Electoral Commission has been calling for individual registration since 2003 and it is broadly supported. But the pace of change, the lack of piloting and the strain on public finances to manage the change is leading to a situation where people who were previously registered are being removed from the register. And one of the main reasons the government gave for this rush was voter fraud. But electoral fraud is difficult to quantify. It is serious, but it is rare. And I don't accept this argument merits disenfranchising so many voters. Evidence shows that these changes will have the highest impact in urban areas among private sector renters, young people, especially attainers, students and those not born in the UK. People who are more likely to move home frequently are at high risk of being removed from the register. I was pleased to see that Shelter Scotland and the Electoral Commission have this week launched a voter registration campaign to target potential voters that live in rented, homeless or temporary accommodation. Electoral Commission research has found that only 63% of those who rent from a private landlord were registered to vote in 2014. This is compared to 93% of people who own their own home and 89% of those who own their home with a mortgage. The rush change to introduce individual voter registration is expected to have a negative effect on these figures and widen the gap between homeowners and renters. According to Hope Not Hate's research, Scotland stands to see a 5.5% drop-off in those registered to vote compared to the 2015 general election, which equates to just over 231,000 voters. This is the second biggest drop in the UK, behind only London's drop of 6.9%. A breakdown of the Scottish figures show that Glasgow will be the worst affected, losing a staggering 67,000 voters. Edinburgh is due to lose 24,000 voters, and in my own region, Fife, we are due to lose just over 15,000 voters. These are people who 
these are, sorry, these are not people who never registered. These are people who were registered under the previous system but will be removed from the new register. They had a vote at the general election but they've now been taken off the register. That is just wrong. No political party should be bringing forward a system that is seeing 1.9 million people fall off the electoral register across the UK, a figure that is likely to increase to 2.5 million due to changes to the student registration system and people in the private sector moving home. This undermines our democracy. In addition to this, we have a boundary commission review which is due in the year ahead. And as a result of the coalition government's parliamentary voting system and constituencies act, there will be a reduction in the number of Westminster constituencies from 650 to 600, and Scotland is set to see a reduction of seven seats. All constituencies are to be set within 5% of the UK electoral quota, so therefore no seat will have fewer than 73,000 voters and no more than 81,000 voters. But it is registered voters, not population. This could have a significant impact across the UK. The new boundaries will be drawn up based on the new register, which was compiled on the 1st of December last year. You could argue this is the weakest point in terms of the completeness, the validity and the integrity of the electoral register on which to base a boundary review. There are huge disparities by registration and during the process of verification, some authorities were able to verify 100% of their um, registered voters. Well, ha for example, Hackney had only um, had 23% of its register that were unverified, so they lost 23% of, of their registered voters. And in Glasgow, 67,000 unverified voters equates to almost one whole seat for the city. This rust process of verification and transition to a new system means it will be difficult for the Boundary Commission to avoid generating distorted electoral maps and constituencies. So what can we do about this? The opportunity to annul the UK Government's decision to bring forward individual electoral registration by a year has passed, but there are ways that we can make progress. As I say, I was pleased to see Shelter's campaign and we need to encourage universities to work with the Electoral Commission to promote registration to new students. We need to ensure that local valuation joint boards are funded and that they're active in supporting registration. More could be done to promote online registration and raising awareness through schools and colleges. But there's also action that we as a parliament can take and credit must go to Anne McTaggart for promoting the Holiday Drops campaign to encourage voter registration among young people. I hope that there is more we can do as a parliament between now and April to increase voter registration in Scotland and regain some of these lost voters. I hope we can all join together and agree in principle for a cross-party and parliament-led voter registration drive ahead of the Scottish Parliament elections in May to demonstrate how much we value voter participation and our democratic structures. Thank you. Many thanks. I now turn to the open debate speeches of four minutes, please, and I call Christian Allard to be followed by John Lamont. Thank you very much, President Officer. And let's first of all uh, thank Claire Baker for bringing that very important motion to, to Parliament. I think it's a very good motion and it's very important to, to, to talk about it today. I, you know, I will maybe have a different tone and maybe a bit stronger about it. Because let's remember, you know, the right to vote is part of our human rights. It's something we should be, we should be not only cherished, but we should safeguard and we should be very strong about it. I've signed the motion and I noticed that he had something missing in it. Uh, the exclamation, exclamation mark. Ten mil million missing voters, presenting officer, exclamation mark, said uh, the title of the brief, briefing report on the failing of the new electoral registration system written by Jane Thomas from the Smith Institute. I was surprised as well. It's the Smith Institute. I, I didn't realize there were several. Smith Institute with uh, Adam Smith Institute, and now this Smith Institute, who happened to be the John Smith Institute, who says that it is independent. But, you know, I, I get a bit confused about all this think tank, uh, uh, some of them very right wing uh, from, uh, from London. So, so I needed maybe a, a, a little clarification of what kind of source it was. I was surprised as well to see that very, very little talked about. In the, in the report about Scotland. Only five words said bring Scotland and twice it brings Scottish. And most of them were, were on a footnote. Uh, it was a little footnote, uh, a refer, uh, footnote uh, two on the bottom of page four, which reads uh, an, an article from the Herald, uh, which said that a local council in early 2015, uh, some 22% of residents in Glasgow had so far failed to switch over to the new system of individual voter registration. The paper warned that as many as 800,000 people who sign up 
uh, for the Scottish referendum may not be eligible to vote at the 2016 Scottish Parliament election. So, you know, the numbers are huge. You know, we should make a big deal about it. It's not small numbers. And it's people who have registered before, who certainly are asked to register. We all have a busy life. And some people are, have got a busier life than we have and, and maybe uh, will not realize how important it is. But we knew what happened then, and, 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 and we, knew, we know why. And the report did say that as well as, I mean, it's 230,000, and Claire Baker said it, voters could be missing in Scotland too. Uh, I think, as I said, I think it's a human right issue. And I was surprised that uh, the, uh, the Smith Institute did not say so, but it was a human right issue. Uh, and and uh, that so many people in the UK are going to be denied the right to vote. I would encourage uh, every MSP to meet the assessor and electoral registration officer. I met Ian Milton a few years back, the assessor uh, and re electoral registration officer for Grampian a few years ago. And I, I'd like to thank him today for some of the numbers he gave me. He gave me one of the numbers, it's quite important, and that shows some other missing voters. One of those numbers was 18,991, the number of EU citizens with G, G or K markers on the register for Aberdeen, Aberdeenshire and Moray. Those 18,990 presenting officers plus one, myself, this French North East, East MSP, will be able to vote on May 5th. But just like we have been allowed to vote in many elections before, Scottish election and local election for years, and in the two constitutional referendum in 1997 and 2014, missing voters, despite uh, the progressive attitude that we have seen since the evolution, uh, have missed uh, many votes and will miss the EU referendum vote unless the courts decide uh, otherwise. It was very disappointing to see that many MPs, 190 of them from the Labour benches, voting against me being able to vote in the EU referendum. And President of it's not only about me, the outrage is that more than two million constituents of Westminster MPs are being denied the human right to vote in this referendum coming on. So we have to be very careful of the human right of its constituents. They are constituents living in the UK, and that, I'm not talking about 16 and 17 years old, you know, some uh, 100,000 of them who voted in that referendum, who will be able to vote on the 5th of May, but won't be able to vote uh, in, in, uh, in Westminster election in 2000. 15, we're not able to, to vote on that one, or in the EU referendum. It's not, democracy is not a tap. It's not a tap that you open and close and hoping that people will register and they register and vote in some election and none of us. Democracy is a right, is a human right to go and vote. And this chamber has to be very, very strong ab about this human right to vote. I would like to conclude, President Officer, uh, to thank uh, Claire Becker uh, for uh, talking about the, the fantastic uh, campaign uh, that chapter, uh, Scotland's electoral commission had done because it's not only about people who live in a house, it could be about homeless people, about anybody living in this country should have the right to vote and we should fight very hard for it. Another democratic deficit we need to address. Britain is definitely a shrinking democracy and that's the Smith Institute saying it. Let's remind the UK government and people living here that the democracy to work, we need people to vote. Presenting officer. Thank you. And I call John Lament to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's um, my pleasure to be able to take part in this debate. And let me start by making it clear that I absolutely share the desire to move towards an electoral register which is complete and as accurate as possible. I therefore commend Claire Baker for bringing this issue to the Parliament. And I agree that all political parties need to work towards increasing the percentage of Scots registered to vote. However, I am concerned that this motion conflates the transition to individual electoral re registration with the broader issue of under-registration. Deputy Presiding Officer, it is important to bear in mind that the purpose of individual electoral re registration, or IER, is to reduce electoral fraud. The Electoral Court judgment in Tower Hamlets was a wake-up call about the vulner vulnerability of our democratic system, and it would be naive of us to presume that Scotland was immune from electoral fraud. The former system required a head of household to submit an application on behalf of all those residents at an address. This sounds like something from the 19th century, and indeed it was. The system was introduced around 1832. We can all recognise that this is an outdated system and was indeed in need of reform. 
the new system gives each, each individual control over their own registration and also introduces a new online application process. It is also worth bearing in mind that the new IER has increased the number of registered overseas voters and has also resulted in an increase in the overall number of people on the register. It is my view that people can't and shouldn't be forced to register and that everything was done to support people in the transition to the new system. The, tra the transition took place over several months. The vast majority of voters were automatically transferred and those electors who could not be verified were contacted on nine separate occasions. I would also urge caution over taking the Smith Institute's report out of context. Their central conclusion that up to 10 million people are missing from the electoral re register is certainly alarming. However, that figure is based on an estimation from the Electoral Commission from May 2015, a figure which has since fallen of the number of people left on the register under the transitional arrangements but have not been verified or contacted. It is wrong to claim that these people have been disenfranchised. What is happening is that the electors who have moved, died or do not exist are being removed. The Smith Institute inflated this estimate number to 2.5 million but failed to explain why and to this they added 7.5 million who were estimated to have not registered under the old system. I agree that under-registration is clearly a major problem, but it's a problem which has little to do with the new system. Under-registration is a different issue from cleaning up the electoral register, and the answer is not to under-register groups. It, it, the answer is not to un, for, for under-register um, groups is not to stuff the, the electoral roll with the names of people who simply do not exist. We should all be encouraging take up in the new system. In Scotland, we have an opportunity to capitalise on the increase in political engagement following the independence referendum. I'll, I'll give way to the member. Claire Baker. Sorry. Um, I appreciate the member taking intervention. I know John Lamont is a reasonable man. The Electoral Commission did say that they had concerns about the shortening of the timescale, that they really felt another year would have been more helpful in terms of the transition to make sure we have an accurate register. Because it is difficult to explain a way which looks pretty evidence-based that the people who are no longer on the register is a high proportion of people who are living in private rented accommodation within there. And it's difficult just to explain that away on people who have died or who have left the country or these other explanations. And I think the government should have followed the Electoral Commission's advice on that. John Lamont, you can have time back. But we should equally be aware of the election court's ruling in Tower Hamlets and the risk um, of fraud and the fact that the vast majority of voters were automatically transferred onto the new um, system and, and for those who could not be verified they were contacted on nine separate occasions to try and verify their identity so I think um, that there has been a change over to a, a, a new system but there has been procedures put in place to try and ensure that the robustness of the system which we now have is as secure as it possibly can be and as I was saying earlier I think we do have an opportunity with the increased in political engagement following the independence um, re referendum to re-engage with um, voters. Residents who are not on the register can still apply by post and for the first time they can do so online and we should be doing all we can, we should be playing our bit to encourage constituents to do just that. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Alison Johnson. I uh, uh, Baker for introducing the motion and also thank the uh, Smith Institute for laying bare uh, a situation which I think uh, perhaps the majority of people are not uh, aware of. So it is important for us to debate this today. And of course, the particular Scottish context is uh, a massive turnout in the referendum uh, based on a very high level of registration. And I think it would be a tragedy if all that good work uh, was uh, undone because of the speed of the transition uh, on to a new uh, system. And of course, uh, it's, it, there's another problem, as Claire uh, Baker and the motion highlight, that uh, this is happening at the same time as new boundaries are being formed for Westminster. And um, as I shall go on to, to explain, as others have, uh, it will have a very big impact on that uh, as well. Now, of course, 10 million is the headline figure, so various people have uh, disaggregated uh, the different parts of that. But 2.5 million people being missing uh, purely because of the transition to a new system is a very high number of people. And that's borne out uh, by other reports as well. And in the motion, it refers to hope not hate and the figure for Scotland there of 230,000 people uh, at risk of disappearing from the register and although that was 5.5 percent um, drop-off since the general election I think it's uh, it, it's much higher percentages for Glasgow and even 
for uh, Edinburgh. And of course, there was also an article um, in the Herald last week, the 20th of January, in fact, which did a poll of local councils, and they came up with the figure of 22% of residents in Glasgow not ha having registered. And they said that if that was repeated across Scotland, it would amount to 800,000 uh, people. And of course, as Claire Baker uh, has emphasised, it, it has a, a particular effect on certain demographics. Uh, people living in private rented accommodation have been emphasised in particular, but we could also men mention students. As an example from England, um, um, uh, 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 in the Smith Institute report of 3,500 students having registered um, in East Sussex, I, I, I presume related to Sussex University, and that that number has fallen now to 377 because previously universities could register a whole whole of residents, that, but now they can't. So there is no doubt there is plenty of evidence uh, of uh, a problem. Now, the, uh, the related uh, issue, of course, is that these registers that are being formed now will be used as the basis for the uh, redrawing the Westminster uh, map. 50 seats will uh, disappear. And the, the, the stated intention is to have uh, constituencies that are more equal, but perversely, uh, the uh, new constituencies could be the, exactly the opposite of what is intended, because many seats will have uh, uh, many more missing voters than others. They all, that, that is already an issue, but of course that issue is going to be accentuated uh, because uh, of the new register. The sophologist and academic Lewis Baston has said, and I quote, the result could be a fiasco that would also be extremely vulnerable to the charge of being a, a gerrymander. So we all need to act together uh, to deal with this situation. I congratulate what Anne McTaggart has done in relation to Holyrood Rocks and younger voters, because they're particularly uh, important in relation to this. And I should also pay tribute to Jeremy Corbyn, because he's appointed Gloria De Piro as a dedicated shadow minister for young people and voter registration. But fundamentally, it's not, of course, a, a party a political priority, but a democratic priority uh, that we should take action in relation to this. And it would be tragic if young people and indeed many other people, particularly who ha have the most need of political change, are in fact the ones to be increasingly uh, disenfranchised and left out of the political uh, process. So it is important that we come together on this issue and take whatever action we can to deal with it. It's probably too late to change the mind of the UK government, but we certainly must campaign to minimise the risk to democracy uh, posed by what uh, has been uh, uh, put into law. Many thanks. And I now call Alison Jones. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to thank Claire Baker for giving us the opportunity to debate this topic this evening. I think as political parties, we have a, a tendency to focus on the number of votes we might get. And I think we pay too little attention to the number of votes that could be, but aren't cast, even by those who are registered. But there are, of course, recognised barriers to voting. Literacy, lack of access to IT, ill health, homelessness, work and family commitments. But given the importance of people voting in any democracy worthy of the name, we have to push this lack of engagement up the agenda and acknowledge that while we here enjoy a fairly advanced level of democracy, there is much to be done to progress it. We have to ask how democratic we are when large numbers of our population aren't taking part in the operation of our democracy. And what are we doing or what are we failing to do in order to get those missing millions back? And the changes to voter registration that the motion focuses on are clearly having a negative impact on the numbers of voters registered at the moment in Scotland, a negative impact that must be addressed. In fact, some of us in this chamber might have experienced or know someone who has experienced a problem with this new system. I know people who have completed the verification process and then received a letter demanding that they do so and telling them that they're not yet registered. And some of those have been really concerned individuals who've wanted to know that they're registered and then they've insisted upon written confirmation that they are on the register, which is, of course, time consuming and expensive, but understandable. But I'd like to use the short time remaining to cover some broader issues relating to non-participation in our democratic process. 
perhaps the Minister, when he is um, closing, can, can tell us more about why companies, some companies are given access to the register for marketing purposes. I know that this concerns many people and how much money is raised by this practice and where does that money go? Perhaps ring fencing some of that money to increase voter turnout or improve registration might be helpful because we have to start to bring the numbers down. The numbers who aren't registered and the numbers who are registered but simply choose not to vote. Why do people feel that voting is a waste of time? Is it because they become disillusioned when they've taken part in umpteen consultations and their, reviews, their views have been rejected out of hand? If we look at the turnout here in the 2011 elections for this parliament, it was just over 50%. So almost 2 million Scots who could have voted chose not to. That's right, they chose not to. And when we think about it, we take the freedom to do so for granted, but that freedom has been very hard won by many people. And how might Scotland change if those non-voters exercise their democratic right, if we could do more to convince them that it was worthwhile? I think we need to look at sharing power downwards and outwards. And the size and areas of population numbers considered local in Scotland would be regarded as regional government at a level above local government in most other European nations. Perhaps our winner-takes-all political culture is an unappealing turn-off for many people. It's a system that values conflict. We have roaring and cheering in this very chamber, that adversarial punch and duty show. And I think it's fair to say that in no other walk of life would this be considered considered. The German constitution, in fact, would forbid national government interference in more regional government matters. Angela Merkel couldn't suggest a council tax freeze, for example. And regardless of what you think about the impact of that freeze, I think this means that power is taken away from local people. We've got an unelected House of Lords, and I think that we've got an outdated, divisive electoral system that forces politicians to ignore huge parts of the population. We do need a democracy that encourages a culture where we collaborate with people and we include everyone. And I think to a great extent, the referendum demonstrated that those millions who do not vote in local, national and UK elections are interested and more than engaged when they believe they have the power to change things. In closing, presiding officer, I think it's really important that we as a parliament take all the action we can to ensure that individual re registration is properly resourced and administered, that no one loses the right to vote. But let's do all that we can. This isn't a party political issue. We have to encourage all in Scotland to participate in our democratic process. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now invite Joe Fitzpatrick to respond to the debate. Minister, seven minutes or so, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I begin by thanking Claire Baker for bringing forward this important and very timely debate. And um, I do welcome the consensus uh, across the Chamber today. The transition to individual electoral registration began in Scotland on the 19th of September 2014, immediately after the independence referendum. As Malcolm Chisholm said, that referendum saw an unprecedented engagement in the electoral process, an engagement that I think we all have a responsibility to foster for future elections, whatever side of the referendum we were on. This government shares Claire Baker's concerns that the UK government's actions around IER undermines all of our efforts and risks thousands of people being disenfranchised. IER replaces the system where one person in each household completed the annual canvas form with a requirement for each person to apply individually to register and for their identity to be checked against other records. As Claire Baker um, and... Uh, um, uh, John Lamont said the UK government's rationale um, is that moving to individual electoral registration um, would reduce the risks of electoral fraud. During the transition period, all existing registered electors whose names and addresses match data um, held by the DWP or local authorities were transferred to the new IER registration system as, conf as uh, confirmed electors, electors. From the 19th of September 2014, the identity of all new registrations um, were, had been verified before they were added to the new register and if they couldn't be um, verified uh, the individual um, then has to provide other evidence of their identity. Um, 
As members will be aware, um, this government was absolutely opposed, as were, were colleagues on other benches, to the Westminster government's decision to bring forward the end of the IER transition period to the 1st of December 2015. We welcomed opposition in both houses at Westminster, but unfortunately neither of those motions to annul were successful. So the Westminster government's decision to end the transition period a year early uh, stands and our electoral registration officers were left to try to minimise the loss of franchise. The figure um, of 230,000 voters in Scotland being removed from the register quoted in the Smith Institute is indeed concerning. It um, came from an electoral commission report which was based on the register as of May 2015, as I think John Lamont said. That, that figure was the number of electors at that point who were registered but who had not had their identity confirmed or verified and were therefore only on the register because of the transition arrangements. Had the transition arrangements been continued, then they would have still been on the register. It would allow them to temporarily remain on the register. However, at the time, the Commission also acknowledged that the canvas activity, which would be undertaken between July and November 2015, um, would reduce this figure significantly. Unfortunately, Scotland-wide statistics um, on the size of the register post the end of that transition period um, and, and the autumn canvas activity aren't yet available. However, if we take one area as an example, then hopefully this will give us an indication of, of just um, how the numbers have changed and just how successful our EROs have been. Um, but I preface that with an understanding that there may very well be regional variations which we need to um, look at. But in Grampian, the number of unconfirmed elector electors has reduced from 19,222 on the 27th of February to 10,636 on the 9th of October, still significant. By the 30th of November, the number remaining had fallen further to 3,893. Clearly, these are, these are people who we would want to, to, to be verified, but it, clearly the, our, our EROs have done a considerable job in reducing that number. The number it's declined um, was because unconfirmed electors either updated their details themselves as part of the process, which allowed their identity, identity to be confirmed, or the electoral registration officers established that they were um, no longer resident and were therefore removed from the register. So that reduction of 80% in the number of electors who were on the register but who had not um, been data matched and our EROs should be congratulated for their efforts in, 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 in doing that. But that's still, I, as I say, recognise that there may be regional variations which we need to be very alert to. Going forward um, and putting it... Sorry, yeah. Claire Baker. Uh, the Minister would recognise that the Smith Institute report also talks about um, the potential for growth in numbers as new students go to university and there's no longer the system as highlighted by Malcolm Chisholm where the university can register um, the students. Uh, have the government got any views on how they can encourage universities in that aspect? Minister. Yeah, it's a point I was going to come to later, but I'll, 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 come, I'll come to it now. Um, it's something that has been recognised by uh, EROs and the Electoral Commission and they're working together with universities to try and tackle that because it would be you know, if, if we think back to the referendum, I, I think young people who voted yes, young people who voted no, they were the, the, the big um, exciting thing that happened in the referendum, that engagement of young people. And to think there's a, a risk of, of, of losing them from the next election, that would be a disaster, which I, I know that our EROs and Electoral Commission are working with universities and, and uh, colleges to try and make sure that we can increase those student res re registrations in spite of the difficulties. Um, so it has, has been recognised. Going forward, um, and I, I think putting aside um, our opposition to the UK government's policy, I'm sure that, and I think we've heard across, across the chamber that Parliament uh, agrees, I think that it's important that we have as complete and accurate an electoral register as possible. And I hope, for, therefore, that members would find it helpful if I can give a brief summary of the new IER canvas and how that compares to the old one, um, which we are most used to. Under the old uh, household registration system, the an annual canvas um, form was completed by one person in each family and once returned, the ERO used that information to add any new voters and remove any who were no longer resident at a particular address. That meant that all the changes could be made before the register was published on the 1st of December, and that's no longer the case. Um, the annual canvas um, in its form no longer exists. It's now been replaced by the household inquiry form. So those forms were issued in August last year, and like the annual canvas, they requested information on those residents in a property who were eligible to vote. 
The difference is that unlike the annual canvas, this is no longer the end of the process and that there now has to be a second stage to the process. When a name is deleted on the returned household inquiry form, EROs have to find another piece of evidence to support the removal of the name from the register. Um, they, can now, they can normally find that through cooperation with local authorities which provide them with the data. Similarly, although adding a name to uh, before adding a name to the register, EROs need an application to register from the individual. Um, every potential elector who has identified on a household inquiry form during the recent canvas has now been sent an individual uh, invitation to register. Um, in addition, every invitation which is issued is subject to a follow-up procedure that involves two reminders and a physical visit to the address. Um, that is a process which is currently underway and I think we should all um, congratulate our EROs on how thoroughly they are they're, they're, they're following out that process which has got those numbers down significantly. Um, so every potential voter who has been identified on the household inquiry form will at least receive at least three letters and a visit to encourage them to register. Um, since the transition to IER started 16 months ago, anyone who was on the register at that time uh, and who has not yet been data matched will have, as John Lamont said, been received at least nine letters and a personal visit encouraging them to, to register for their vote. And, you know, so th in addition to EROs and the Electoral Commission, in addition to that, EROs and the Electoral Commission are continuing with their efforts to encourage voter res re registration. That goes further than the 2.5 million and into the, the, the 7.5 million that the report covered in terms of those folk, some of folk who have never registered and we want to get onto the register in time for the Scottish Parliament elections. Um, in the run-up to, to our, our elections in May, the Commission are planning to run a mass media public awareness campaign across a mixture of TV, digital and social media and will be providing resources which can be used um, as part of EROs and ARO's local public engagement work. The main um, campaign is scheduled to launch on Monday the 14th of March um, with advertising appearing on digital channels from next Monday. But as I think Claire Baker uh, mentioned, um, there has been some work already and we saw the work of, of Shelter on the telly just last night. And that's part of the, the, the Commission's national campaign which is targeting the sorts of group that Alison Johnson mentioned. The, a real focus on those groups that research has identified as being less likely to be registered. So people who have recently moved home, um, homeless people, people who rent their home, students, as we've talked about already, young people, and um, people from some black and minority ethnic communities. So there, there is absolutely no taken... Um, Sitting on our laurels, there has been a huge amount of progress taken. It would have been better if EROs had another year to do that process, but they've done a great job and they're, they're working really hard to go even further to get more people on, on the register. I hope that information reassures members that the electoral community right across Scotland is working together to ensure that the electoral registers are as complete and accurate as possible in time for the Scottish Parliament elections in May. And again, I would like to thank Claire Baker for bringing this debate to the Chamber at such a timely moment. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. That concludes Claire Baker's debate, 10 million missing voters. And I now close this meeting of Parliament.